Oh, hello there. You know, whenever I visit Gray Falls, I love to come back to the home where Charlie and I lived for over 25 years. We bought this land and built this house with the little inheritance money that Charlie got from his family. And when we did all those years ago, why, it was only a few blocks from the edge of town. And now look at it, how Great Falls has grown. Do you have a few minutes? Because I'd love to show you around upstairs. Now watch your head because that ceiling's kind of low. And this is Jack's room. Of course, there was no Jack when Charlie and I moved in. Children do make a house a home, though, and we tried for children of our own, but were unsuccessful. Then, when I was 38 years old, Dr. Longway called and said he found a baby boy who needed a home. So we brought him here and called him Jack, and, well, we fell head over heels in love with him. Charlie loved children, and he doted on Jack whenever we were in town. And when we traveled, our dear neighbors, the Triggs, often looked after Jack. He was a smart little boy, and he kept up with his studies. He was only nine years old when Charlie died. And this is the only room in the upstairs that we put any color to, a powdery baby blue. Ah, here's the old hallway. You know, we often had a lot of visitors, and sometimes they needed a place to stay in a pinch, so we kept a cot bed here. I remember one winter we had three Episcopal clergymen snowed in with us for the better part of a week. And from this window you can see Charlie's studio. Oh, here's a picture of it. We built it in 1903 so that Charlie would have a place to paint and work away from the constant stream of visitors that were always coming through this house. Of course, Charlie always had a constant stream of visitors of his own out there in the studio. One of Charlie's greatest joys was to make campfire suppers over that open hearth fireplace there in the studio. The invited guests were not to come near until the food was ready. There was usually bachelor bread and boiled beans and fried bacon, maybe some game, coffee for sure, and dessert must be dried apples. And he was always thrilled if somebody asked for seconds or praised that bread. Then Charlie would sit back on his heels and drift back to the days when he first came to Montana. He and his friends could spend the whole night lost in their stories of the old times. And this is our largest spare room. When my closest friends came to stay with us, this is where they slept. My friend Josie Wright from over in Cascade, she came here and finished her schooling and did some chores and such for me until she got married to Fred Thorpe right downstairs in the front parlor of this house. And my half-sister Ella, she lived with us for a while. We helped her finish business school and then she worked for the newspaper for a few years before she married and moved on. Oh, look at the, look at the hat boxes. I'd forgotten about some of these. When we traveled to the big cities, New York or San Francisco, we were always amongst the finest dressed people in the world. Now, Charlie and I were never behind the times, but we had simpler tastes. I always wore modern gowns and hats and suits and such. But Charlie, well, whenever we had a formal occasion, it required a dinner jacket. I did not require that of Charlie. A dinner jacket and a hard-boiled shirt, as he called it. He would just have been miserable. Charlie had his own particular style, and, and I knew that's what would make him the most comfortable. Oh, huh, look! Look, the sewing machine! Oh, how many times did I come home from some of those trips thinking that I would sit down here and create some fashions of my own? But those were mostly good intentions, because every time we got home there was another exhibit to plan or some travel arrangements to make, some copyrights or framing or shipping or something. I guess that's part of getting older. You look back on your life and you wonder if you could have rearranged it a little differently so that you could have done some of the things you really wanted to. Oh, this old door is still here. Mr. Calvert, the builder of this house, he knew how much I wanted one. 
a few years after we moved in, he surprised us. He surprised us with this hardwood door and a full-length plate glass mirror. I felt like a queen. <laughs> there is so much light in this room. Charlie loved the light, of course, and he was up not very long after sunrise. He'd dress with just a couple of minutes, and then he'd go downstairs, out to do chores, watering the chickens and the horses and such. Then he'd come inside, and he would make breakfast for the entire household. Wasn't it a big surprise for a new cook on her first morning when she woke up and the master of the house had fixed breakfast for everyone? She soon got used to that. Then Charlie would work in the studio and then come in for lunch. And I'd do business and domestic activity chores during the morning. But after lunch now, he'd visit with his friends or, or maybe we'd go riding. We love to go riding here or at our place at Lake McDonald. It was an important part of Charlie's life to visit the natural world. In our cabin there on Lake McDonald, in what is now Glacier National Park, that was such an important part of the year for us. He always came home brimming with ideas for art that he could put on canvas in the studio in the coming months. <sighs> Charlie always said that our relationship was a 50-50 proposition. I figured early on that if I could just keep the world away from Charlie and I do everything else, that he'd be free to make all the art that he wanted to. And I'm pretty good at business. I'm pretty good at managing the rest of our world. So Charlie appreciated my efforts, I'm sure, even though he didn't have to know all the details. This is the smallest room of our house. We used it mostly to store trunks and such. When Charlie and I traveled, sometimes we'd be gone for weeks or months at a time. And these old trunks sure bring back a lot of memories. In 1914, Charlie had an exhibition at the Doré Gallery in London. And while the experience of going to Europe was remarkable for both of us, the process of getting there and back was awful. March is a terrible month on the Atlantic. That ocean did everything but spill us out of the ship. We two prairie people were pretty seasick. Charlie said it feels like I swallowed a bull snake and he won't keep still. When we went to Paris, oh, you talk about fashions. Well, I wanted myself a, a lovely little Paris bonnet. And Charlie promised to go shopping with me over what he called 35 miles of hats so that I could pick one out. And I found one and, oh, I wore it for years. I always felt so well dressed in it and I never saw myself coming from the other direction. Now this water closet, that was quite unusual for there to be a water closet on a second story in a home back in those days. But every time I think about this room, I think about the night that Charlie died. That year, 1926, Charlie had been sick most of the summer. And then in the fall, well, it was October, a Sunday in October. He was having a wonderfully good day. The Thurmans, our friends, came for supper. And, well, it got kind of late, so they decided not to go home. So we all went to bed early. And then a little before 11 o'clock, I woke up, and I knew something was wrong. I found Charlie in here, struggling to breathe. We got him back to bed, and then the doctor arrived, and he said to the doctor, I don't think I can make the grade for you this time, Doc. Not very long after that, he was gone. I was so privileged to be the wife and partner of Charles M. Russell, and to work together with him to leave such an incredible legacy of art and stories that will go on for generations to come. Now, when you leave here, I want you to go over to the studio if you haven't already. That's the real thing. That's where Charlie worked and created his masterpieces. And this home and that studio tell Charlie Russell's story better than anyone or anything ever could. So thank you for coming today.